Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday Morning Breakfast Bible Study. We thank you so much for joining us this morning, and we pray that you are going to uh, receive a word uh, this morning. I am Pastor Lydia Spragan, and welcome to the Saturday Morning Breakfast Bible Study. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you now. awaiting the day that we shall remember and commemorate your resurrection. We ask you, Father, that inside we remember what your resurrection means to us personally. We thank you, Father God, for the gift of life abundant life and eternal life. We thank you, Father, for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Father, that we can come boldly to your throne of grace. We thank you, Father, that you sent the Comforter to us to lead us and guide us into all truth. We thank you, Father, that we have woke up this morning in our right minds finding clothes to wear on our backs and a roof over our heads. We thank you, Father, for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. And now, Father, as we prepare to study your word, help us, Father God, to come to know who you are through your word and have a closer relationship with you today than we did on yesterday. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Well, here we are again, and we are still studying uh, the word of faith. Now today, we're at step seven. Now step seven involves us uh, incorporating the question method of Bible study. Now, what would a new Christian want to understand about faith is the approach that I took. But your approach may be different. What questions have arisen during your study of faith, perhaps that you didn't get a chance to answer? Jot those down here. What questions do you want to be able to answer about faith? Jot those down here. What questions uh, will prompt you to go further in your study of faith? Perhaps in other places in the Bible, which we'll get to later in this, in this lesson. Whatever it is that's on your mind, write it down. Now that does not mean that you will have the, the time to study it now. But when you go back, perhaps in a year or so, and you review this particular study, then you will see, oh, I had these questions. Let me see which of them I can answer now, or which of these questions I, I want to do further study on, or which of these questions um, can I teach somebody else, perhaps the person that I am discipling about. So. Here is my list of questions. Keep in mind they do not have to be your list of questions. Question. What is faith? In what three ways will faith manifest itself according to the Bible? The Bible also teaches that faith will manifest or demonstrate itself in three ways. It will manifest itself in doctrine, what the Bible teaches. It will manifest itself in worship, communion with God. It will manifest itself in morality, righteous behavior, and godly living. Now, I realize that that's not quite a question. But that statement was quite deep to me when I read it and I studied it. And I said, I don't really have time to study that now. But at some point in time, I want to go back and look at what how faith manifests itself. 
And so I'm going to jot down the three ways that faith manifests itself so that I won't forget this aspect of my faith study. Again, it manifests itself in doctrine, what the Bible teaches. It will manifest itself in worship, communion with God, and it will manifest itself in morality, righteous behavior, and godly living. Next question. How does a person exercise faith? Now remember, I'm always um, attuned to what the new believer might have a question about, or how I can share with a new believer, or someone who doesn't know Christ yet about something that I'm studying in the Bible that might be pertinent to them at that particular moment. So the question might arise, how does a person exercise faith? How can we have stronger faith? And then I, I write down the question because this term, historical faith, was new for me in this context. So what are the historical uses of faith? What are the historical uses of faith? What does the Bible say about how Christian faith is developed and strengthened? How does the original language define faith, both the Hebrew and the Greek? I didn't really have time to go into it. I just scratched the surface when we looked at it a little earlier. Um, then you might remember that I talked to you about a, a pastor named Grant Castleberry of the Capital Community Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. And in his sermon series, he stated that there were 10 types of faith. Well, from my study now, I'm ready to go back and re-listen to that and really understand it. And he said the 10 types of faith were supernatural faith, childlike faith, repenting faith, surrendering faith, living faith, self-hating faith, treasuring faith, urgent faith, knowing faith, and loving faith. And a bonus one, he said, was honoring faith. Now, what I want to know is do I agree or disagree with Pastor Grant Castleberry? And we need to support our answer biblically. I say that to say, even when I am preaching, I don't want the members to just simply sit on the pew and take what I say and say, oh, Pastor preached today. Oh, I sure did get a good understanding of that. I want you to go home. Find at least one sentence or two sentences, or perhaps a, uh, if I make a list in my sermon such as this, write the list down, and then go home, and during the next seven days, investigate it, search the scriptures, see if what I say is so, see what is your point of view, struggle with it. So that you have a good understanding. And you can incorporate the word into your life. Now, a lot of us don't do that. When we leave church, we have been to church and we done with church for the week. But see, we can't just shelf church. Okay? Worship, remember, is a 24-hour, 7-day-a-week. 52 weeks a year it's a lifetime it's a lifestyle and so we ought to be incorporating things into our lives on a daily basis that will show that, that we are worshipers of God and part of that that we can incorporate is the study of God's word now do you have to spend an hour every day no most of us don't have an hour for God during the day if we are honest with ourselves. We have an hour for television programs. We have an hour for other things. But we don't really have an hour for God every day that we set aside. God bless you if you do. But five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes a day that we can spend time with God reading his word. Studying his word. 
we ought to have by now a little place set up in our houses, a little table with our Bible, two versions of it, perhaps a Bible dictionary and a concordance that we can sit, or a Bible encyclopedia, or something to that effect, that we can sit back and we can actually look at the Word five, ten minutes every day. Now, if we do that five or ten minutes every day, then at the end of the year, we will have studied the Word much more than if we had not taken the Word up except but on Sundays. Okay? We will have seven times as much word in us and seven times as much word to draw upon than we did if we just have word on Sunday. Now, the next step, step eight, after the, after the question method. Remember, those are your questions that you're going to jot down, that you're going to write, that, that they're going to mean something to you. And Bible study should mean something to you personally. And if you study in a group with people, it should mean you may want to have a couple of group questions that you jot down. Okay. Step eight. Find another, find other scriptures that contain the word you are studying. Now you will use your concordance. And in your concordance, you will go and look up the word faith, and you will find uh, verses where the word faith are used. And you can just take a couple. I use the concordance in the back of my Bible. But you can type in your search bar, where can I find the word faith in the Holy Bible? But be careful. The search says that the word faith appears 788 times in the Holy Bible. 788 occurrences in 13 translations. So we know that we have a lifetime of study ahead of us if we study the word faith. Okay? It's not something that we're going to start today and end today. We're going to continuously be feeding upon the word faith. Whenever we run into it, uh, we might say, oh, there's that word I studied. It's in a different context now. So I don't have time to study it right now, but I'm going to jot it in my little faith notebook over here that I found it in another passage of Scripture. Okay? Now, here's some... Uh, what I did was, since I'm looking at it in the context of Hebrews 11.1 1 and Romans 17, what I decided to do was look at the cross-references that go to these verses. Okay? A cross-reference is another reference that might give you some insight on the reference that you are looking at. So, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so I start to look at the cross-references. And the first one that I came to was Romans 8 and 24. Romans 8 and 24. And it says, for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he can already see? That gave me some pause. The evidence of things hoped for. Who hopes for what he can already see? 2 Corinthians 4 in 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Oh man, that blew my mind. That blew my mind. For what is seen is temporary. Here today and gone tomorrow. I see my coffee cup today, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. It's useful to me today. May not be useful to me tomorrow. But what is unseen is eternal. God is unseen. 
We can feel the air we breathe, but we can't see it. If there's a storm, we know it. But in him, we move and have our being. That, that pneuma, that pneuma breath. Without him, we can do nothing. That's the unseen, that's the eternal. Then 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, I mean 5 and 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We won't be able to see what we are believing by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 3 and 6. But Christ is faithful as the Son, S O N, capital S O N, over God's house. And we are His house if we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope of which we boast. We learn that faith is about assurance. It's about confidence in who? In God. If we hold firmly to our confidence in God, our, our uh, assurance that God's going to do what God said he's going to do, even though we might not see it now, and the hope of which we boast. The next verse, Hebrews 3 and 14. Hebrews 3 and 14. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the assurance we had at first. Now that, 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 that was just deep to me. If we hold firmly to the assurance that we had at first. Nothing wavering, nothing doubting. We just holding on. We're not going to let anything separate us from holding on to the faith that God can and God will do it. Not necessarily when I want him to, but he will make the, all things beautiful in his time. In his time. Hebrews 10 and 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Look at how it describes us. Look at how it describes us. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That's the way I like to be I want to be described as a woman of faith, somebody who, who has faith and, and is preserving their soul through that faith and not shrinking back, not shrinking back, not being destroyed. Listen, if you are wavering betwixt and between and you can't make up your mind and you have doubt and whatnot, then you don't have faith. You don't have faith. And what I pray, which is the greatest prayer I believe in the Bible, you don't have to agree with me. But what I pray is, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. It's the greatest prayer to me in the Bible. Lord, I have faith. But help me where I doubt, where I waver. Help me where, where something is trying to pull me away from the... Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Hebrews 11:7. By faith, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in godly fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world 
and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, Hebrews 11 is full of people like Noah. But Noah is one that, I'm, that we're familiar with. He didn't even have a clue what rain was. But God said, build me an ark. And Noah set about uh, looking at the plans and following God's direction and building an ark. Then he went out and gathered the animals. And then he and his family were in the ark. The ark of safety. The ark of safety. Why? By faith. He didn't know what was going to happen. They probably thought he was the craziest man on earth. And then when the water started to come, drip, 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 drizzle, 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 downpour, 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 not stopping. Then they began to see the truth of what the prophet Noah was saying about God. And what he was saying about get right and repentance. And what he was saying about building an ark of safety. And I'm sure they came running to the door. Knock, 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 knock. Let me in. But it was too late. It was too late. Don't wait until the last moment. Become knocking at the door. And say, God, let me in. You need to hear his voice today. Jesus is standing outside the door and he is knocking. He wants to come in and sup with you. He wants to come in and be a part of your life. He wants to come in and share with you your ups and your downs, your trials and your tribulations. He wants to be for you a friend that's sticking closer than any brother. But he can only be that if you open the door and let him in. It's your choice. It's your choice. Hebrews 11:27. By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Listen, Moses has been out, put his feet, and he, can, and he has been in the presence of a burning bush. A bush that was not consumed by the fire. He has heard a voice that says, take off your shoes, take off your sandals, for you are on holy ground. Now, he's seen and he's heard it. But he doesn't yet know, per se, who he is. Who is it that I shall say, send me? And he says, I am that I am. I am sent. It will become some time before he actually has the great understanding of who I am really is. The miracles are, uh, or the plagues, are as much for Moses as they are for Pharaoh. Stretch out your rod, turns into a snake. What? I am has this power? Turn the water to blood. I am has this power. Good Lord. Who is this I am? And that's the question that we begin to ask. Even from the first uh, verse in Genesis. When it says in the beginning God. We say who? Who is God? And from Genesis. To revelation, God is revealed to us. 
He sent his son, Jesus the Christ, down to the earth. He came himself, God with us, Emmanuel. But in Revelation it said, who is this that has come to you? Who is this Jesus the Christ? And now it, it starts to reveal, it becomes the revelation of Jesus the Christ. God has revealed himself through the ages of time. And then God gets down to the last because He says the revelation of Jesus the Christ. And he tells us that we'll receive a blessing if we read it. Now, all of that ties in because faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. We haven't seen God. But we know that he is. We know that he moves. We know that he knows all. Sees all. Is present in all. We know. That he is all powerful. How do we know these things? By faith. We put our faith in the invisible God. We put our faith in the invisible God. Whom we have not seen. But whom we worship and dare to worship. In spirit and in truth. We put our faith in the fact that he loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to live among us, to die for us, and then rise again in our place that we might have life, life more abundantly and life eternally. Life eternal is this. To know God. To really know God. Listen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Is really a very deep verse. A very deep verse. But let's move on. To Romans 10 and 17. Where it says. That faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Hearing by the word of God. Job 42 and 5 says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. What? Job, the man who lost everything. He says, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Naked came I into the world, and naked I shall return. Dust I came from, to dust I shall return. But during that time of my stay on the earth, I have suffered. But I am not going to forget about the God that I heard about. And I'm going to go through this period of time. Because I know. Who he is. Because of what I heard. But then God came to him and spoke to him. And he, he had questions. And God answered his questions. And then God restored him. More than he what more than he had before. And he says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. We don't want to have to suffer but like Job to be able to make this statement. 
My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Galatians 3 and 2. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? That question is just as pertinent today as it was when, when Paul penned it to the church at Galatia. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? What's your answer? Galatians 3, 5. Does God lavish his spirit on you and work miracles among you because you practice the law or because you hear and believe? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Because you hear and believe. Not hear or believe, but because you hear and believe. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, you just can't have faith and hold on to it. You got to teach it. You got to admonish one another with all wisdom. Faith and wisdom go together. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13. And we continually thank God that in receiving the word of God from us, you did not accept it as the word of men, but as the true word of God, the word now at work in you who believe. It's at work. It's in you who believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews 4 and 2. For we also received the good news, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, since they did not share the faith of those who comprehended it. Now, there is why we need to do evangelism in a nutshell. Listen. But we also receive the good news. Just as they did. The folk out in the world. They done heard about Christ. They heard about the Bible. Some of them grew up in godly homes. And they are now out there. They did not make the same decisions that we did. We received the good news. We ran with it. We by faith are uh, 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 hearing it and hearing the word of God. We are applying it to our lives and we are moving on in Christ. We can't leave them behind. No one left behind. We ought to be like the United States Marine. No man left behind. Can't leave my brother behind. So, the message that they heard was of no value to them. What we got to say is, listen, the word of God is precious. It's like a rare jewel. It's like a diamond. It's like a pearl. The, 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 the word of God is precious to me. And that's where our testimony can begin. Is why does the word of God, why does my life in Christ have value to me and meaning to me? That's what I want to share with them. Maybe they won't get it. But maybe they might see some value in what you say. And they might come to, to see for themselves and investigate. 
since they did not share the faith. They don't know. They don't know of those who comprehend it. But we who know, we who comprehend it, ought to be able to explain it, share it, live it in such a way that if we lift up Christ by our lives, that somebody is going to be drawn unto him. We got to have a living faith. A living faith in God. An assurance. We can't doubt. We can't doubt God. Especially in front of those who don't know who he is. Well, they doubt him. I guess I don't see no reason I ought to, ought to believe. Yes, sir. There's a reason you ought to believe. And we ought to walk by faith and not by sight. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What a word. Now we are ready to move on to step nine. Write down any passages. Including the translation or version of the Bible in which you find them. Which are meaningful to you. Then employ the S-O-A-P SOAP method of Bible study. Now this method of Bible study might be new to some of you. So I'm going to walk you through it. S-O-A-P. S stands for scripture. Prayerfully write out the verse of scripture in your notebook. O stands for observation. Highlight specific words that made this verse worth writing down. What does God want you to learn from this verse? What new insight have you gained about the word you are studying from this verse? O is for observation. A stands for application. Application. How can you put this verse into action in your daily life? We're not just studying the word to be studying the word to make ourselves scholarly. No. We're not studying it to, to make ourselves no more than the next man or woman. What we are doing is trying to study the word so we can apply it to our Lies. Remember, you have to work out your own soul salvation. I can't do that for you. Grandmama can't do that for you. You have to work out your own soul salvation. So, how can you put this verse into action in your daily life? Does this verse cause you to desire to take something out of your life that is not pleasing to God? And now is no longer pleasing to you. Because you studied this verse. Is there something in your life that's. Man I shouldn't have that. Going on in my life. I need to get rid of that. That's not pleasing to God. And Well fr quite frankly. Right now I, ain't, I don't care too much for it either. So it need to go. Need to go. We are. On the potter's wheel, and we are clay, and we are marred. But if we stay in the hands of the martyr, of the potter, he will make a vessel out of us that is useful to him. And that's what we want to be: is useful to God, designed for His purpose and His plan, to be used 
in the way in which he has designed us to be used. How can we put, how can you put this verse into action in your daily life? Does this verse cause you to desire to take something out of your life that is not pleasing to God and now is no longer pleasing to you as you walk with God closer today than you did on yesterday? This is probably the most important aspect of the study. Now that we have all of this knowledge, all this, how are we going to apply it to our lives? How's it going to transform the way that we live and witness for Christ? How is it going to transform our hearts? How does it transform and renew our minds? What, what, what strongholds are we going to be able to, to knock down? Because we now have this word of faith, this study of the word of faith in our arsenal. P. P stands for prayer. Ask God to make this verse come alive in your life and in your witness to others. Now again, the, the verse step nine is write down any passages, including the version or translation, which are meaningful to you. Then employ the SOAP method of Bible study. Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Now, you may only study a few words this deeply. But when you do, you will have a deep reservoir from which to draw when someone asks you about that particular word. This type of study produces an understanding that continues for a lifetime. Remember you are doing a word study not to make yourself look big and better, but to be able to show that God loves, cares for, and desires everyone to understand his word. Don't forget Proverbs 4 and 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. I hope you have been blessed by this study. Now, I'm going to take the next few minutes that we have here to kind of go back and review. Now, I did do a few other things, but for our study, for our purposes, we have now had a faith word study. We have laid the foundation for us to have an in-depth look at any word. We have now learned how to use and integrate other Bible tools into our study. We've learned that we don't have to go out and purchase these tools, that we can go to our local library or to the internet and actually study from there without spending money. That's important. But if you find a tool that you really like, that really opens up the word to you, you might want to, I have to save up, you might want to save up and purchase that particular tool to add to your library. Now what you are building is a Bible study library. It does not have to be comprehensive. It has to have tools that work for you. Okay. The plumber doesn't have the tools that the carpenter has. The carpenter doesn't have the tools that the brick mason has. But in the same way with us in Bible study, we all won't have the same tools. We all won't know how to use all the proper tools. I, I, I'm, I'm good with a hammer. I can do fantastic things with a hammer. But I can't do the same things with a saw that I can do with my hammer. I can't do things with a level that I can do with my hammer. 
But I'm good with a hammer. So whatever tools it, it they are that you decide that you're going to put into your library, work with them. Maybe once a quarter. Some of them you might use more often than others. But you want to become proficient in using those particular tools. So let me go back now. And remember we always start our, our Bible study with prayer. Okay. And now you have a notebook on how to study the word of faith. Now if you decide to go back and study grace or mercy or propitiation or some other word in the Bible, great! I, I, I would commend that to you. To actually get proficient in how to do a word study. Step one. Choose your word. Choose your word and the context in which we shall study the word. Because sometimes different words uh, have different contexts. Um, for example, even the word faith. Faith in God is not the same as the faith. The faith. Okay? So you, depending on the context in which you study it, is how you're going to learn what that word means. Okay, so step one, choose your word and the context in which you shall study that word. So we chose the word faith and we chose to study it in the context of Hebrews 11.1 1 and Romans 10.17. Step two. Choose the translations you will use in your study. And for word studies, I would recommend that you use a literal translation. Okay? Um, like the King James, the New American Standard, the Amplified, the English Standard Version, or the New King James Version. Now, what you may want to do so that you will make sure that what you are doing is understanding what is there. Is once you've actually looked at the literal translations, you might want to go to another translation. I like the uh, New Century Version. It's easy for me to understand and I don't have to think a lot to get the meaning of the scripture. I can just read it and enjoy the word. And so when I'm doing a deep study like this, I might just want to go back and take a couple of minutes away from it and just read the word in enjoyment. Of course, I'm going to add some richness to that, to that meaning of the word now because I'm actually doing a word study. So even though the, the, the translation might be uh, non-literal, I'm going to have that background and that knowledge that I'm going to bring to the translation. Okay, um, so step two, choose the translation that you want to utilize. Then you're going to get to step three. Look up the word in an English dictionary. Look up the word in an English dictionary. Step four, look up the word in a Bible dictionary. Look up the word in a Bible dictionary. And like I said, I usually spend a lot of time with the Bible dictionary um, because that's where I, I like to spend most of my time uh, studying the word. Um, then we go to the next step. You can see I spent a lot of time, a lot of space in the Bible dictionary. Step five, look up the word in an expository dictionary. E-X-P-O-S-I-T-O-R-Y. Step five. Step six. Look up the word in a lexical dictionary. Lexical. L-E-X 
I-C-A-L. So we've got several dictionaries where we can come and look up this word. An English dictionary, a Bible dictionary, an expository dictionary, and a lexical dictionary. Then, step seven, uh, utilize the question method of Bible study. The question method of Bible study. That'll give you some time to reflect on what it is that you've actually learned and make your own personal observations and notes and questions that you have. Step eight. Find other scriptures that contain the word you are studying. Find other scriptures that contain the word you are studying. And for that, you're going to use a concordance. Now, most study Bibles have a concordance in the back. But if they do not, then you want to go to something like a Strong's Concordance and look it up. And when you look at the Strong's Concordance, you'll also find the Strong's number where you can do further study as well. We studied, I think, the Strong's number in conjunction with using a, a lexical dictionary. Then, uh, step nine, which is the last step that I have here, and it's write down any passages, including the version or the translation, which are meaningful to you. That means you're going to now go back and do a whole review of this study. And you're going to see what actually meant something to you. What scriptures actually meant something to you. What observations did you make? Or did these scriptures cause you to make? Um, how are you going to apply it, A, to your life? Not only to your life, but to your witness. Um, and then lastly, pray. Pray. So I would like to end this Bible study with a prayer that I wrote. And we're going to finish up a little bit earlier today, probably about six minutes or so early. And next week we'll have a new Bible study series or a new Bible study uh, topic that we're going to be discussing. <coughs> I thank you for joining me in this Bible study. And I pray that you have gotten something out of it. Let us pray. Thank you God for revealing to us how to, to not only study your word, but the words which comprise your word. So that we may not only grow deeper in your word, but also in our relationship with you and in our ability to communicate with understanding your word to others. Amen. Well, this draws this series to a close. And I have learned a lot by teaching it to you. And perhaps for some of you, it's been a refresher. For some of you, it was eye-opening. For some of you, it's, it's been, wow. Really? How often does she do that? Let me tell you honestly and sincerely, not often. Because these kinds of studies take time. They take time. And I don't always have the time to devote to the study that I should. I'm being honest. I'm being honest. But by breaking it out an hour at a time, or 20 minutes at a time, or some smaller block of time, I am able to put together what I hope will be a beneficial study for myself first, and then you. Now, what I would encourage you to do is to go back and review it. 
and then find somebody that you can share it with. Um, when you share with somebody, it becomes more deeply ingrained in you. Because you have to know it to teach it. And if you don't know it, you have to learn it. And if you don't know, then you have to look it up. At any rate, you are going to be engaged and hands-on and interactive with the actual Word of God while you share it with someone else. Um, and like I said, the study of God's Word is not necessarily just for you. It's not necessarily just for you. It's for you to be able to proficiently, not argumentatively, share with someone else. Now I know I prayed a prayer to end the study. But I would also like to pray a prayer to end this particular study. Let us pray. Oh Father God, we could not have done this without the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father God, for sending the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us and to teach us what we need to know about the truth of your word. Father God, we ask that you apply this truth in our lives. Places, Father God, where we may need a band-aid, apply the truth of your word there. But sometimes, Father God, we need more than just a band-aid to fill a hole in our lives. We need, Father God, to be refreshed, revived, reinvigorated, renewed by your word. We need, Father God, to, to just know that this word means something to us. And that we mean something to you. So, don't just let this word faith fall on our ears today and leave our lives and leave us just walking around filled with doubt and worry and fear and concern. Help us to remember this word of faith that we walk by faith not by sight and that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It is the assurance that we have in your ability to do what you want to do because you are sovereign. And we know, Father God, that it comes in levels. Help us to have faith to the fullest level. That we, Father God, might be able to look at situations in our lives and say, by faith, we are going to overcome it. Not by our might, but by your ability, by your sovereignty, we're going to be able to overcome it. Help us, Father God, to, to be able to hope for things and expect things from you. And know that you will not disappoint us. We can have historical faith in the fact that we know that you paid the light bill in the past. You paid the taxes in the past. You paid the car note in the past. You can do that now and in the future. You can supply all of our needs. That's fact. And we can use those facts to build our faith in you. Knowing that God can do all things, both the possible and the impossible, if we only believe, have faith and confidence in God, that he can and that he will do it. And if you choose not to do it, that's sovereign too. Help us, Father God, to just let you be the head of our lives. To let you sit on our throne. 
to be the king of our lives. And then, Father God, make us and mold us as you would have us to be. For your purpose. To go out in order that we might worship you in spirit and in truth by our daily lives. Not just on Sunday. So that we can lift you up from the earth. So that all men can be drawn unto you. All women, all boys, all girls can be drawn unto you. For it is your heart's desire that none should perish. And you have no hands except our hands. No feet except our feet. No tongue to speak except our tongue. That we might live the life that we preach, pray, sing, and testify about. So that somebody else might see and hear. But they don't yet have faith. But they need to see it, they need to hear it, they need to be able to put their hands on something tangible and say, look at, and we can point them to you. The great I am. Because you are. We exist. Let us not take the glory but give all the glory and honor and praise to you. Let us let our light shine so that they can have a, 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 a light at the end of the tunnel. But let them be able to see the brighter light, the light of the world. Who will dispel their darkness. Help them to get to know you Father. And help us to get to know you. Better today than we did on yesterday. And give us that holy boldness. And courage. To go out and tell somebody, anybody, everybody about you. In the name of Jesus the Christ we do pray. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Amen. And praise God. Well, it's been wonderful. And I hope and pray that you will go to church somewhere. Uh, especially this Sunday Resurrection Sunday If you have uh, No place to go And you live in the Pittsburgh area I invite you to come And worship with us At the New Destiny CME Church Located at 825 uh, Lorenz Avenue In Pittsburgh Pennsylvania We look forward to seeing you And We hope and pray that you have a great next seven days. That the presence of the Lord will be with you. That his favor will be upon you. And remember God really does love you. And so do I.